Hey, everybody. With the Consumer Technology Association, I'm Tyler Sutras. We are the owners and producers of CES, the largest, the most influential tech event in the world. We are here to help you get CES ready. The upcoming show is January 7th through the 10th, 2020 in Las Vegas. And today we are tackling the issue of startups in a big way. You probably know Eureka Park well. If not in person, then certainly by word of mouth. This is where investors come at CES to find their next unicorn. Major companies from around the world are there looking for acquisitions or partnerships. And of course, media from international outlets are there looking for stories and inspirations and ideas. You'll find startups from more than 40 countries at Eureka Park, more than 1,200 startups overall from every corner of the globe. So today, a conversation about what you can find at Eureka Park. First of all, we are talking to a company called Popcom, which has an interesting e-commerce idea. And yes, there is a vending machine involved. Also, an interview with the mayor of one of the world's technology capitals, the mayor of Seoul, Korea. And we are talking to a company called Trinet. And if you don't know their name, startups know what they need from this company. This is a professional employer organization, and it gives small and medium-sized businesses full-service HR solutions that are tailored by industry. So a wide-ranging look at the world of startups and entrepreneurs, all framed through the lens of Eureka Park at CES 2020. That's on this edition of CES Tech Talk. Don Dixon is CEO of Popcom and a serial entrepreneur. Don, I'm glad we got you standing still long enough to, to have a conversation. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's really great. I, I definitely love being a member and involved with the CTA. Serial entrepreneur. I know that gets bandied around quite a bit for, for various uh resumes and, and introductions, but that really applies to you. You have a long and more importantly, successful history as a, as an entrepreneur and, and working in the startup space. Um, how's your journey been? You know, that is true. Like I reflect back and it seems like it goes slow, but fast, but I started my first tech company in 2001 in Columbus, Ohio. Um, after I went to study IT at DeVry. I mean, I lived in Columbus, as I said, and I just wanted to gain some tech skills that would be transferable into me getting a job. Entrepreneurship wasn't in the front of mind when I went to study um, IT. I just wanted to be strong, you know, on my resume. But once I got into the program, I realized like how tech could be applied to everything that we're doing in life. And this was in 2001. So it wasn't like a mass adoption of like all the tech we have today. Obviously, Apps didn't exist. Social media didn't exist. People barely had an email address for personal use. Websites, you know, businesses didn't have websites. There was no Amazon. So it was the very beginning that I seen then that like tech was going to change everything. And that's what really started me to thinking about how can I use my tech skills to change and improve things in my day to day life. So how did so, you and it just kept going from there? You how know? did you find your way, Don, into IT? Then it's interesting. You, you were a journalism major in college, which I certainly admire. Yeah. Um, and then you, uh, as you said, went to DeVry. But why IT? Why was that a calling for you? Because when I was in college, my last um, year of, of school, when I was just focused on my journalism major concentration, I had a job at the local news station, and my job was to upload the news at the end of the day or after the broadcast onto the website. It was the first station in the state to have online news and it was through FTP, um, which took hours, you know, a long time to process, take the reel and make it into video and nobody wanted to do it. So I had to learn how to do it from the IT guy because like I was the, you know, the college student and <laughs> nobody in the newsroom wanted to deal with it. But I learned that skill. And when I seen that, I was literally the only person at the news station besides the actual IT guy that knew how to work this. I knew that it would, it would add value to, um, you know, when I go to get a job in the newsroom, me being able to work with the Internet would be helpful for me in a competitive space that didn't really pay a lot. Um, so that's why I went to school for IT, just to strengthen my overall understanding of just how the Internet works and what it is. 
Uh, true ninja innovation, adapting to your circumstances and and, and thriving. Um, yeah, I have to. <laughs> always want to be competitive. Always. Well, in that sense, um, you know, this isn't your first rodeo. Popcom is is your latest venture. However, um, talk about the the space that yeah. you occupy right now and uh, how the idea came together for you, Don. Yeah, definitely. Um, Popcom is an automated retail technology company, and we have a software and hardware solution for self service retail. So what that basically means is we make software and um, vending machines and digital kiosks. Self-service retail is just anywhere that the customer self-serves, meaning there's no person helping them check out. So we use these every day, like at the airport with the kiosk, you have the grocery store checking out, um, drug stores have self-checkout, many restaurants, uh, they have where you can place your order on a kiosk. This is the space that we operate in. And what I discovered um, is that there weren't many vending machines that were targeting uh, consumer retail products like they do in like say Japan or China where you can buy almost anything from a vending machine. In the U.S. it's been primarily concentrated on food and beverage um, and you know coffee and vending for many years and I really I had a product that I started and I still have this business called Flat Out of Heels and they're rollable ballet flats for women when their feet hurt wearing high heels. And my idea was to sell these shoes and vending machines to women in places like nightclubs and airports when their feet hurt. And I felt that vending was the best direct-to-customer distribution method for an emergency product of that type. And I couldn't find anyone to build a vending machine for me. And so I got into the hardware business in Mitchell in 2012. And then as we started to build this hardware, I realized that, you know, the hardware of that time, 2012, 13 was really what I call, you know, dumb hardware. It just dispenses. It doesn't collect any data, analytics, and anything about the customer journey. And I know that retailers rely so heavily on this data from me having a retail background that um, I figured that, you know, to get mass adoption for retailers to sell high price items or even anything over, you know, $5 in a vending machine, they need data analytics. And that started my journey in building software. Um, it seems like adaptability is the theme we keep coming back to um, for your journey as an entrepreneur. Uh, is that the main trait or can you even identify a main trait, Dawn, for what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur, to make it as um, a serial startup entrepreneur? I certainly think you know that there, just, you know, flexibility, um, having the ability to know when it's time to pivot or make adjustments to, um, you know, your original idea really going deep into um, product market fit and understanding your customer's needs and understanding the industry as a whole to see what gaps you can fill and where you align. And so I identified there's a lot of people making hardware. Mm -hmm. They don't need another hardware manufacturer, but all this hardware is dumb. So what I could do is come in and be kind of like the windows, like the operating system to make these machines smarter. And even though there are several vending companies that do have, software to make their machines smart it's not for anyone but them there's no central operating system that any vending machines can use to uh, update their existing capabilities so again it was just me really digging deep into the industry and that's like that's my strength is um research and um not really going off of my need but getting an understanding of what the customer needs are and that comes from a lot of the surveys and reports and talking to people which is a lost art these days actually picking up the phone or just talking to people and not sending out emails and things but uh, getting to know what, what what they need and how you can help them yeah in-person connectivity can be underrated no question in person <laughs> um yeah your point about um vending machines in the past being dumb or or to, to turn that around making vending machines smart um can you outline some of the technologies, Don? I mean, these are high-level technologies, too, that, that you're implementing implementing in Popcom's technology, in your products, in you know what you're investing in technology-wise to make this venture work, to make vending machines smart? Yeah, definitely, certainly. And I was inspired greatly by Google Analytics and Shopify and of just IoT. You know, the first step in making vending machines smart was connectivity. And prior to, you know, 2011, when I got my first machine, there were probably 10% of vending machines that even accepted credit cards. So that was a big step that obviously I didn't initiate, but it needed to happen connectivity in order to be able to access the cloud, in order to be able to communicate with device to device. So that was great. And 
Um, SAP definitely helped to lead the way in that space. But what we did is take it a step further and say, okay, now that they're connected and they can be connected and they can use, accept credit cards, how can we access and understand um, customer data more without violating that data, of course, in age of privacy being the number one thing. How can we learn more about the customer while still respecting their, their privacy? And so the way that Google Analytics does that is by IP address tracking. But as we all know, we're in a brick-and-mortar environment. So I thought, what is the similar, you know, what can we measure what would be an IP address in a physical and retail environment? And that's actually the human being, like the actual physical body of the person. Hmm. So we use facial recognition to do things like count traffic that walks by. So that's your traffic, um, just counting the people. Then we'll take it a step further and capture the gender um, to 92% accuracy, whether it's male or female identified gender, which helps to get another layer of understanding of who's walking by and what is that traffic uh, makeup demographic profile and traffic pattern. Then when they walk up to it, we get an understanding of what are your conversion rates, how many people are engaging. Just using the face recognition and machine learning to capture this data and analyze that data. Um, then when they get up to the machine, we do the journey analytics, which includes what will be called heat mapping in e-commerce environment. How are they interacting? What are they clicking on? How long are they spending on each page? How long does it take them to, um, you know, go through the transaction cycle? Or if they abandon their cart in this instance, walk away, what is a triggering point for them? How are they feeling in front of the machine? Are they happy? Are they neutral? Are they frustrated at any certain point of the user journey? So that the um, retailer can get understanding of how they can improve the actual uh, POS and the user, um, you know, the UI UX of that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do is use face recognition and machine learning to just capture customer data at the point of sale and in the, in the venue. Mm -hmm. um, while we're talking strategy, Don, uh, you are not, uh, a CES newbie. <laughs> this will be your your fifth time no. um, at attending CES, working at, at, at CES. What is your business strategy going into there? Without without giving away too many secrets, uh, how does a veteran like yourself approach the show and engage with the people you need to meet? I mean, obviously, there's so much to do and see, and um, it could be overwhelming if you don't have a plan. The great thing about uh, CES is you can see who the exhibitors are and the programming ahead of time. And so for me, um, I really focus on industry specific things. I mean, I am a consumer, so I like to go see the cool things in between time and all like the just fun activations that brands do. Um, but for me, the primary thing is to go out and engage with uh, companies um, and exhibitors that align with automation, retail, um, you know, anything cool. Like I found at CES a couple years ago, a company that would put makeup on the face, um, like a, an app you can look in they put different makeup and for me that was cool because I felt you could do that on a vending machine so mm -hmm. I always discover new things and get new ideas that apply to my product there I also look and see who's speaking um, in companies I want to partner with or of course of companies I want to partner with or exhibiting and go and try to just make a contact there it's great to make contacts also like the member lounge is awesome that's why I love being a member um, access to be able to go sit and, and network and interact and have a time to just like sit down you know in, in the space but um, getting to meet other CTA members is always, like, a benefit. And um, also just mapping out the time from the show hours and the, sh and the official events to, like, all of the other events and networking things that go on after hours. So I map my schedule out in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, great pro tips, including remembering to sit down once in a while uh, <laughs> during show hours. Yes. Um, what about... CES 2020, Don. What uh, are you looking for as CEO of Popcom? Um, what it, What is your anticipated takeaway or the goal you're trying to come away with? You know, once we hit January 12th, 14th, you know, a week or so after the show. I mean, for for us, we have a booth in Eureka Park, so just gaining more visibility um, for our product. We're finally launching our product. We were we did exhibit in Eureka Park in 2017. And that was more just to get validation and product market fit to see if people even thought what we were building was cool. Mm -hmm. And they did. And it was like overwhelming response and lots of great contacts. But we had to go back and like modify, and make some updates and fix the product based on the feedback that we heard from just people using it. And so now we're ready to actually, you know, go to market. And so just really debuting um, the product, interacting and engaging with people on the floor um, and just the, getting the buzz built. There's so much buzz there. There's so much media that walks by. There's so many 
people that walk by that I don't know that I can work with them to even point them out in advance, but they walk by and they identify a way that they can work with us. So I just want to meet new people, connect, get the bug going. I mean, of course, you a, um, I'm going to be speaking there as a part of the Faces of Innovation Startup Edition. So um, being on that panel and getting more visibility again for, for the business and uh, making, making new connections for sure. Don Dixon is CEO of Popcom, and if you don't feel energized and more enthused listening to her, you need to rewind and play this podcast one more time and, and pay closer <laughs> attention. Don, great to have you with us. I feel like this conversation could go for a few hours, but we'll push pause for now and really looking forward to connecting and seeing you uh, in Popcom doing your best at CES 2020. Thank you so much. I'm super excited. With us now is the mayor of Seoul, Korea, Park Won Su. And Mr. Mayor, wonderful to have you with us today. So Seoul, Korea is known as one of the technology capitals of the world. If you would, describe the startup scene there in Seoul. As of September 2019, there were a total of 160,326 startups in Seoul, which is a significant increase from four years ago. Startups in Seoul account for 24.2% of startups in Korea, and most of them are in the field of knowledge-based services utilizing information technology and science technology. Seoul is truly the startup hub of Korea. Also, 9 out of 11 unicorn startups in Korea are headquartered in Seoul. Korea ranks number 5 among world cities in terms of the number and size of unicorn startups. Furthermore, investments in venture startups are very active in Seoul. In fact, in this year alone, more than 4 trillion Korean won have been invested in venture startups. Indeed, thanks to the active investments being made by the private sector and the policy efforts being made by the public sector, including the central government and local government, a vibrant ecosystem for startups and ventures is being created in Seoul. Currently, there are around 400 startup intermediary organizations in Seoul. 46 startup support centers have been established by the Seoul Metropolitan Government. And also, 111 out of 207 accelerators in Korea are located in Seoul. Seoul's overall ecosystem for startups is becoming increasingly more developed and advanced. Mr. Mayor, how is Seoul itself and and really the country as a whole, how are they supporting innovators there? The Seoul Metropolitan Government is striving to make Seoul one of the top five global startup cities in the world. We are providing a package of support to startups throughout different stages, the initial investment stage, the product manufacturing stage, and the testing and demonstration stage, so that these startups can scale up quickly and enter into the market successfully. Also, we are providing specialized and customized support to startups in various sectors. The Seoul Startup Hub is serving as the control tower for our startup support policies. The Seoul R&D Innovation Hub is providing support to startups related to AI, and the Seoul Bio Hub is providing support to startups related to biomedicine. We will also open an innovation academy by the end of this year to post talented young individuals who will not only begin their own startups but also lead the post industrial revolution era. Furthermore, we will create a Seoul Furthermore Innovation Growth Fund worth 1.3 trillion Korean won approximately 1.3 billion U.S. dollars by the year 2022, so that we can lay the foundation for an ecosystem for startups that will help create more decent jobs for the future generation and lead the future growth of new and emerging industries. I highly recommend everyone who is watching this podcast to come to Seoul, come to Seoul and begin your startups. We are pursuing a visa-free program for young and promising entrepreneurs for overseas and are providing public rental housing at affordable prices as well. In addition, we are cooperating closely 
with global startup intermediary organizations and accelerators in the US, Europe, and Asia to help startups in Seoul attract global investment and enter the global market. Earlier this year, we held a global startup festival called Startup Sub Tech Rise 2019. More than 4,000 participants, including startups, investors, and accelerators from 20 countries, came to Seoul to exchange their views on the recent trends of startups and discuss about opportunities for investment and growth. Mr. Mayor, what can we expect from the city of Seoul coming up at CES 2020? Actually, this is the first time that Seoul is participating in the CES. We are going to open up a Seoul booth at the CES venue to showcase the city's smart city policies to participants from all over the world. Since several years ago, we have been establishing very advanced and modern smart city infrastructure and technology throughout the city. Our goal is to solve various problems that citizens face in their daily lives regarding transportation, environment, economy, and more through smart city infrastructure and technology so that these citizens can lead much better, happier lives in the years to come. The Seoul booth at CS will be operated under the theme of smart city and smart life. We will display a smart city platform called the Digital Mayor's Office. Through this platform, participants will be able to see everything that is happening in the city in real time and the way that we make policy decisions during urgent situations. They will be able to have a first-hand experience of a smart city and smart life. They will also be able to see startup ecosystem that we are creating in Seoul and also the innovation products that various startups have made, which will be displayed separately. Seoul Mayor Park Won Su, a pleasure to have you with us, sir. Thank you for joining us. Michael Mendenhall is with Trinet. He is Senior Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, and Chief Communications Officer. Michael, great to have you with us talking startups today. Yeah, a, a pleasure. Very excited. Uh, and excited for CES. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Uh, let's start up. First of all, tell us a bit about Trinet, uh, what what your marketplace is and what your plan is moving forward. Yeah, so tr- Trinet is a 30-year-old company. We seem to be somewhat new. Uh, we've grown in the last 10 years, almost 30-fold. Um, and what we do is we provide HR solutions to small, medium-sized businesses. <laughs> and why is that important? Well, of the GDP in the United States comes from small, medium-sized businesses, 98% of the workforce. And what's really important is about 43% of all scientists and engineers actually sit in this space. And it's where you see a lot of innovation taking place through, you know, seven sort of different verticals that we look at as a company. What does that mean? Well, a lot of these, these companies, these startups, these entrepreneurs, um, really have amazing ideas that they're solving for, whether it's in biomedicine, using technology. You know, a lot of these industries like Beyond Meat, um, they're using technology to really transform an industry um, and provide what is socially a really good benefit for people, healthier lifestyle, healthier eating. And so a lot of these folks are very focused on that type of innovation in their given vertical, and they don't have the time to really build out you know, a huge operation relative to managing your people. Um, You know, uh, when you begin to think about uh, when you're managing people and you think of HR and HR solutions, you're really talking about risk, compliance, uh, compensation, um, investments, and investing in your people has become really, really important. And, And why is that is, you know, we have the lowest workforce population we have ever had, probably in the last certainly 60 years. And we, we also have very low unemployment. You just saw the most recent date on that, the lowest in 50 years. You start to think about, oh, wow. So, um, you know, the competition for skilled talent is becoming really important. And so as you start to add up that sort of census data, and then you look at an entrepreneur, whether they're in technology, you know, life sciences, professional services, financial services, 
they're looking for quality people, but they want to hold on to their people. And what we do know is, you know, most people now today, you know, change jobs every two and sort of three quarter years. So you've got to not only find the right talent, but you also have to um, hold on to them and retain them. Uh, On that that note, on that note, Michael, I'm, yeah. I'm curious about your background because you have a unique perspective on this. And and look, your resume is is peppered with major names in the space, right? IBM, HP, Disney. Um, what is your point of view that you bring to a company like like Trinet about what those startups really need when you're coming from these major corporations, these global conglomerates? Well, it's really to to support them because, um, well. First, I'll go back and I'll talk to you about what a lot of these uh, companies that I've worked for really were looking for. Many of them were looking to either transform their business, uh, start a business, um, or acquire a business. All of these companies were looking for a narrative to actually accomplish something, whether that be to grow a business, launch a business, do an IPO, um, and or uh, build a brand. And, and that's become really important in a commoditized world. What is Trinet's strategy for engaging that audience you want to reach at the show? Well, we, we, we started out with, you know, most people think of HR as sort of just a, a function within a company that handles mechanics. And, you know, we really believe, again, when I talked about that census data and, and what these companies are trying to achieve, certainly these small entrepreneurial companies, uh, who, who really want to break through, communicate their idea and the necessity of that. You know, a lot of them are really, um, you know, looking for help. Like, I don't want to have to deal with all this back end. I, I know what, what I need. I know the talent I need. I know the experience I need. <clears throat> and I've got to go out and find this. And I need some people to help do that. I don't have the resources, nor do I want to apply the capital to do that internally. I'm too small. I have 50 people or I have 20 people, uh, so I'd rather outsource that. And so what we're in, our intent is to really showcase uh, to the CES community, you know, how we can help them actually scale very rapidly, give them the kind of benefits that somebody would have at a Google, yet they're only 20 people. And why is that? Because we provide great scale. Um, uh, And that scale gives us leverage to, to help provide um, uh, those services to these companies and, and help them build success. So what we're going to do is we're going to be, you know, over at Eureka Park uh, with, with a booth um, that's in the Sands Convention Center, and, and we're going to meet and, and, and help uh, share with these folks how we can build success for them. Michael Mendenhall is Senior Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, Chief Communications Officer as well for Trinet. You can find them at CES 2020. Michael, interesting conversation. Thanks for your time. Thank you. All right. Coming up next time on CES Tech Talk, a broad, wide-ranging conversation on all things CES, a conversation with the leaders of CES and CTA among the topics why every company today is or needs to be a tech company. Well, CES is such a smorgasbord of great ideas that there is a tremendous amount to see. That's coming up next time on CES Tech Talk. Now we want you to be CES ready. So, hey, download the CES app. You can build your own agenda, find your favorite exhibitors. Also, look for the speakers and the panel sessions you really want to see. That's all using the CES 2020 app. A reminder, the show is January 7th through the 10th in Las Vegas. You can get more information to plan your trip at ces.tech. None of this podcast would be even remotely possible without our true stars, our executive producer, Tina Anthony, and our senior studio engineer, John Lindsay. You all are the best in the business. I'm Tyler Suters. Let's talk tech again soon.